It's book reading time again, so this will be a fun one. I'm going to read two chapters, I think, tonight, and then uh, we'll get through the book a little faster. This is going to take us from page 144 to the end of page 171, so almost 30 pages. Um, I think that this is one of my first times reading in my full new set. No, that was last time. I took a night off, but uh, that was... I don't know. I am tired. I spent uh, six hours coaching students today, and I'm done. So, this is me time. I, I watched. Oh, my camera's not in a place where I can use it very well. I'm going to bring this down just a touch so I can actually read my page while I work. So I'm reading off a screen in front of me. Oh, there we go. Yeah. A little how the sausage is made. Fun times. And make sure that's in good focus. Bring up the cam software and hit autofocus. Yep, that's where the page is at. Beautiful. All right, so here we go. The Wounded Sky by Diane Duane. Chapter 9. Is our course confirmed, Mr. Spock? It is, sir. Uhura is the message away to Starfleet. Set into the inversion apparatus, Captain. It will go when we do. Is the crew ready? Yes, sir. Mr. Sulu, give us... No, never mind the countdown. Uhura, notify the crew we're going. All set? Very well. Engineering, implement. They jumped. The evening wind blew, and she lifted her head to it, catching strange scents with the familiar ones. Pine was there, but so was Ra so was Rawasku. She smelled sage and cypress, but also blue star and talastima. From far away, toward the rose and opal sunset, a sound came floating, a low, coughing grumble that made the hair stand up on the back of her neck. There was no mistaking that. Lion. She lifted her eyes to the darkening sky and saw two white moons, one unmarred, one stained and scarred with Maria, drifting toward the burning horizon. A third, tiny and hasty and rose-red, leapt up from the, under the opposite horizon as she watched and chased after the other two. This was Serengeti, then, the fifth planet of Procyon A, where the once-endangered creatures of the Terrene Plains roamed free and untroubled by hunters. She'd never had the time to come here, though the place had been her idea of heaven when she was a little girl. Serengeti was just being founded when she was five or six, and some story her mother told her about it got mixed in with all the other stories about animals that were able to talk to each other and sometimes even to people. She decided then and there that she would be a Serengeti ranger when she grew up and go talk with the animals, and go talk to the animals. What she found out as she got older was that it wasn't so much the animals that fascinated her as the talking, communicating with another kind of life, finding out what it was thinking, sharing her thoughts in turn. And Starfleet was the place where they taught you to do that. She plunged into academy, graduated and forgot all about Serengeti beckoned outward by the wonders and strangeness of Vulcan and Tell and the Setians, Orion and Auskau and the Aldebaran worlds. Now she stood in the crimson grass of the Serengeti equatorial high veldt, looking up at Mount Mer... How do you say that? Mount Meritaja, in his snow-capped majesty, and laughed softly, a small, glad sound in the huge, windy silence. This was where what she was had begun. It was high time she acknowledged it. She glanced down at herself and found herself suitably attired, jumpsuit, bug belt, slogging boots, and at her side not the familiar minimally powered Federation phaser, but a blaster worthy of the name that could vaporize half a hill. Out here it might come in handy. Not for the animals, of course, but there were rumors of poachers. Heaven help them if they run into me, she thought, starting to walk for lack of a better goal, toward the sunset. The ecology of Serengeti was one of the most delicately balanced in the Federation, the more so because it was contrived. Computers had spent years on it, constructing a careful, complex... 
constructing a careful, complex interweaving of alien species with species, preserving the native Serengeti food chains, slipping the once endangered Terran species in among them, one by one. Poachers, drawn by furs and hides that would command astonishing prices in the far spaces, were the chief danger to the precarious balance. There were other dangers, too. The computers hadn't been able to anticipate everything. Plagues. Accidents. The terrible, outraged squall of dismay and defiance that echoed across the grassland from the direction of the mountain brought her up short. It was repeated, and she was running toward the sound before she clearly knew what she was doing. The blaster out of its sheath, its safety off, its status circuits singing the high-pitched triad that told her it was at full charge. Reflex, she thought with grim humor. But this was no rescue of a beleaguered landing party. There was no telling what awaited her in that strand of Nrara trees up ahead. Leaving the tricorder back at the lodge was a dumb idea. At least I've got the blaster, though. She thought she would slow down before getting to the corpse of Nrara, then circle around and reconnoiter. She never had a chance. Something bigger than a lion, much bigger, erupted out of the tall grass in front of her, leaping straight at her face. Reflex saved her whipped the blaster up into line and smoked the thing in mid-leap. She thought she recognized the shape before she vaporized it, but it was too late to be sure now. Whoops! For it wasn't too late. Two more huge shapes attracted by the shrill of the blaster came leaping along after the first. Land sharks! Some part of her observed with great calm. Other parts of her, frantic, concentrated on blasting them before they made dinner of her. She found herself looking right down the roaring throat of the second one, past all the rows of teeth and into the reeking gullet half a meter away before the blast effect engulfed it and struck her to the ground in an explosion of scorching, stinking gas. She scrambled up and ran again, heading for the corpse of Nrara at full speed. Stealth was no use now. The terrible, raging beast cry was closer, louder, and more urgent. Another land shark came plunging out of the trees at her. She had more of a view of it this time. In the uncertain twilight, and her blaster lit it more brightly still as it killed, the four-meter-long body, the vivid vermilion and white fur, the eight legs, the blank, blind, white eyes of a heat-seeker. She dodged around the hot smoke that was all the blaster left of it and ran into the copse. More of the land sharks saw her, but not before she saw what they were after. There was a tar pit at the heart of the stand of Nrara, slicked over with water from an earlier rainfall. Trapped in it, one terribly torn flank turned toward the shore, was the biggest elephant she had ever seen. The only one she had ever seen in the flesh, anyway. It saw her, slashed sidewise with its tusks at one of the land sharks that was trying to get at it, and then raised its trunk and trumpeted in savage salute. She had had her work cut out for her. There were too many land sharks, and they were fast. The only chance she had was to get her back up against something so that she couldn't be attacked from behind. Reflex took over for her again. She blasted a land shark coming at her from one side, rolled, twisted, and came up with her back to the tar pit and the screaming bull. The hunting pack's tactics changed. They gathered together and began attacking cunningly from one side, then another, testing the new alliance. She heard the bull squealing in rage, striking, a bright-patched body thumped to the grass by her feet as she smoked one of its packmates. The land sharks were snarling now. The first... The sound first surprised and frightened, then heartened her. They hunted silent when they thought they had the advantage. Two more leaped at her from opposite sides. She blasted one of them and it was... She blasted one of them and was about to do the same to the other, but never had the chance. A huge trunk plucked the land shark out of the air in mid-leap and smashed it with a thick, wet sound to the earth. Eight left now. Nope. Seven. But that was still too many. The chord her blaster sang had dropped four tones in pitch. It was losing power, and a crisis light on one side told her she'd been stuck with a defective charge pack. If the ship didn't send her some help pretty soon, she was going to be dinner, despite all her intention otherwise. And... There was the shimmer of transporter effect a hundred yards away. Ears among the watchers twitched at the soft singing whine. Several of them turned to leap away from it. No! she screamed, and the suddenness of the sound confused two of them enough for her to smoke one and burn a leg off another. 
It screamed, too, and went hobbling off into the tall grass at terrible speed. She had bad thoughts about wounded beasts as the thought of the transporter faded out. So, let's try that again. She had bad thoughts about wounded beasts as the light of the transporter faded out. Oh, let them be armed. Look out! She cried as loudly as she could. Look out! They're coming! And then two more of them were coming for her, and there was no more time for shouting. Breathe, damn you! Breathe! Breathe! It was his worst na nightmare come true. He damned for the thousandth time the idiot courage that let this man throw himself among wild beasts and into blaster crossfire for his crew's sake. Luckily, it was just a graze he'd taken. But things were bad enough. His hand on the chest found no respiration, no heartbeat. He peeled back an eyelid, found the pupil reactive even in this fitful light. It contracted immediately. Thank God! Still no pulse at the carotid, though. Carotid? Still no pulse at the... Still no pulse at the carotid, though. No problem. He felt the sternum, made sure of the location of the cartilaginous xiphoid process at the sternum's end, so as not to bruise the liver or spring the ribs loose, then let him have it. The precordial thump on the sternum that starts the heart going six times out of ten. Wham! The fingers on the carotid still felt no pulse. God damn it, you couldn't make it easy for me, could you? He started cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Chris! Leah! He yelled. Some one of you get over here and breathe for him, damn it all! Keep the pressures sharp now. Don't lean on your fingers and lessen the force. Don't you dare, don't you dare, oh Jim, don't you dare! Blaster fire erupted too close by in the strange-smelling night, followed by the thick sound of a corpse slamming into the ground some yards away. He saw the glizzer... He saw the glitter of a phaser being tossed to someone else, and Christine fell down beside him and right on top of the unbreathing form. He didn't have to say a word. She grabbed the patient's head, pried his jaws apart, made sure the airway was patent, and began artificial respiration. Great gasping breaths, probably high in CO2, due to her own terror. That's all right. It'll start his chemoreceptors working faster. He'll breathe. Leah! He hollered. Another phaser went off right above his head. The body that fell did so practically on top of the three of them this time, stinking of singed fur, its ruined face sagging slowly out of a rictus of shock, staring at him, staring at him reproachfully from where it lay. He knelt there on burning knees, with sweat rolling down into his eyes, and noticed that in and noticed in that odd timelessness of crisis that Leah had needle-burned the monster right between its milky eyes. Probably waited until it was close enough for that shot, goddamned little show-off, he thought. She is good, though. You have to say this for Christine, whatever else you might say about her. She's got great lungs. Take it for me, he gasped, and Leah thumped down to her knees beside him, hesitated a second to get the rhythm, knocked his hands aside, positioned her own, and thrust down, not missing a beat. Not bad at all. Maybe there's something to be said after all for nurses who act like doctors. He fumbled for his kit. Cordrazine? Hell no. He's shocky. Kill him for sure. Cyclohexin? No. And Verisol? No. No! Who packed this kit anyway, goddamn supply computers? If he dies, I'll take an axe to them. The roar right in front of him brought his head up just in time for him to see the land sharks leap and say goodbye to life. Prematurely, Catullic flashed glittering overhead, leaping right over him to clutch the land shark eleven-legged in midair, simultaneously knocking its leap sideways and using the twelfth leg to slit its throat with a cool precision that made him shudder. Dead land shark and live homalki hit the ground together several meters away. He turned his attention back to the kit. Rofenicin, Unifactor, Suspinar, Androsam G. Yes! He slapped the set, he slapped the ampule into his spray hypo, didn't even bother hitting the pre sterilized cycle. He's got bigger worries right now than germs. A V, he said to Leah, and she slipped out of his way to let him fist the hypo into the space between two ribs to the left of the sternum. The body under all their hands spasmed as the drug violently stimulated the heart's A V node, and the cardiac muscles started working again. Watch him he said, hoarse-voiced, shaking all over at the disaster that had been averted one more time. 
D5, concentrate till we can get him topside. Don't bowl us at Leah. He's got enough problems. Neonor, if he flutters. Christine. Or Kaladex. Whichever you think is better at the... Whichever you think better as the blood pressure requires. What the hell's the goddamn ship doing? The Klingon phasers hit their screens, and this time there wasn't the whole power of a warp drive behind them. They were failing. He'd never wanted to see screens really begin to radiate into the ultraviolet, as in the old stories, but the Enterprise's screens were doing it now. He hoped it hurt the Klingon's eyes. It sure hurt his. Scotty! He shouted at the intercom. No answer came back. This is awful, he thought. Where is everybody? We can't do anything about the landing party, not with the goddamn clingers hammering at us like this. The ship lurched after one particularly nasty hit. A bad sign. It told him that the skin field was failing to protect the Enterprise's sensitive electronics, and the particularly sensitive guidance and artificial gravity systems were going, Oh God, what do I do? He thought, as, for lack of a better idea, he started tying all the major bridge functions into the helm, including engineering, which he scrutinized carefully. The ship was in orbit on impulse as usual. Scotty will kill me if he finds out about this. And he'll find out about it. And he'll find out about it. That's the idea, though. To leave everyone alive so they can be mad. The last time they'd supercharged the screens from the warp engines, the Enterprise had escaped being blown to plasma only because she was traveling so close to sea already. He didn't have the leisure to bring her up to that speed now, even if the Klingons, even if the Klingons would allow it. Yet the shields had to be strengthened, and he knew how to do it, or thought he did. He didn't pretend to understand the inversion apparatus in the slightest, but he knew from his boards that it put out a tremendous amount of power when operating, which it was now. Are we in inversion, then? Must be. Doesn't feel like it. Not that I miss choking. Never mind that now. He spoke hurriedly to the engineering computers, making sure of the connections he should have making sure of the connections she should have the inversion apparatus's power feeders make to the screens. The engineering computers, programmed by Scotty, confirmed that the connection was possible, and with Scotty's own conservatism, urged that it not be made. The hell with that, he said, even as he himself hesitated for a moment in terror. Triple override. Implement. The ship began howling with imminent overload alarms as the illimitable power inherent in the Desitter space poured itself through the tight little funnel of Enterprise's control systems and out into the screens. The screens backed down out of the high violet, through indigo and blue and green, then began to glow brighter and brighter till they were searing white. None of the Klingon fire made the slightest difference to them now. So much for that. He slumped back in a seat. He slumped back a little in his seat, then straightened up again, horrified, fascinated. What did I do? He thought, but the screens began to grow, swelling outward. Several of the attacking Klingons backed away. One did not, just kept firing, then stopped abruptly when the Enterprise's screen hit his, and both the Klingon screen and the Klingon ship simply winked out of existence, as if someone had turned them off. Good Lord, what have I discovered, he thought, watching with frightened satisfaction as the other Klingon backed off even farther. Hope this doesn't do the same thing to the planet. As if they heard him, the screen's expansion began to slow, until, finally, they stabilized at several kilometers distance from her. Thank heaven, but there are other problems. He bent to his boards again. With this new power source, there was a way to get the landing party back even with the screens up. Connect the transporter system to the inversion, too, so that the signal will be strong enough to pierce the screens and not pick up interference. Just to be sure, tighten the bandwidth of the transporter signal to near coherence at the ship end, allow it to fan out again on planet, a neat trick, that, one that Uhura had suggested him for more mundane signals. He spoke to the computer again, told it what to do with the transporter beam, and soon was hearing by remote that satisfying musical whine that told him everyone was back. Red alert! Red alert! The ship was shouting, so that Sulu had to shout too, to make himself heard over the din of sirens and other alarms. Emergence confirmed, sir. I'll say. Shields! But a glance at the writhing, distorted image on the front screen told Jim they were already up. That writhing, though. What in the... He started to get up, then sat down again. He felt 
terribly weak and dizzy. A bar of pain like a phaser burn lay across his chest, and his ribcage felt like somebody had been using it for a trampoline. The communicator whistled, and it was all he could do to punch the button. He was in such pain and confusion. Bridge? Jim, don't you move. How does your chest feel? Uh, memory came back. I jumped in front of Spock. There was this wild animal. He stopped. At least it felt like memory. Confused, he hooked a finger in the collar of his uniform tunic and peered down inside, then wished he hadn't. I did it again, huh, Bones? I'll be right up with a stretcher. Bones, this is no time. You be quiet. You'll only be on your back for an hour or two, long enough for me to regenerate any heart tissue that got damaged. Argue the point and go into shock, and you'll be down here for two days. But, Bones, it wasn't real. There was a very brief pause. You, lack the, you look at the front of you again and tell me that, Jim. Out. Jim hit the toggle hard in annoyance and bewilderment. What the devil's the matter with the screen, he said. Ship status? The problem is not with the screen, Captain, Spock said, stepping down beside the command chair, but with the sensors, which are giving us data that makes very little sense, or very little conventional sense. If I take the present readings at face value, and there is no reason not to at this point, we would seem to be in a place where the fabric of space itself is being terribly deranged by repeated intermittent loss of entropy. Something acted to augment the ship's screens during inversion. I did that, Mr. Spock, Sulu said, sounding pleased and confused and worried all at the same time. Spock put up. Spock put one eyebrow up. Then it's well that you did, Mr. Sulu. He somehow tied the screens into the inversion apparatus, Captain, despite the fact that he could not have. Neither we nor the ship exist or should be capable of physical motion or even mental action during the inversion state. Spock made an expression of patient resignation. At any rate, what Mr. Sulu did probably saved all our lives. Catullic's portable entropy, if I might call it that, was keyed into the screens. Their failure would have entailed the failure of our protection as well. And had that happened... There are thousands of fatal errors that could have occurred in the most vital operational systems of this ship. Fatal not only to the systems, but to us. Good work, Mr. Sulu, Jim said. So, Spock, what are all these damn alarms about? Well, Captain, as I said, the conditions the sensors are picking up from outside are mostly unlikely, and occasionally impossible. There is a great deal of radiation of all kinds out there, including Hawking radiation, a very distressing finding, for Hawking radiation is typical of the close neighborhood of black holes. Yet, the censors also insist there are no black holes hereabouts, or not for long at any rate. Not for long? Spock actually shrugged. The readouts are most illogical. Mass and screen, sorry, mass and energy seem to be coming and going at unpredictable intervals. Stars appear and vanish, or go nova and then reappear unchanged, in complete defiance of, conser of conservation of energy. Not surprising, the laws of thermodynamics all require the flow of time to function. Jim stared at the screen. Someone had turned it off. Get me a visual. I would not recommend it, sir. Why not? Medical reasons. Jim opened his mouth to get top... Oh, sorry. This is Spock speaking. We'll back that up. Jim, scared... Jim stared at the screen. Someone had turned it off. Get me a visual. I would not recommend it, sir. Why not? Medical reasons. Jim opened his mouth to get tough with Spock, then felt the cough waiting down in the bottom of his chest. If he tried to get loud now, it would completely ruin, a... it would completely ruin the effect. Precisely, Captain, Spock said. Sir, you know I am the only member of the crew who cares to be on the observation deck in other space. The view outside the Enterprise right now is one I will have to look at in the pursuit of my duties, but I will not inflict it on myself more than necessary. 
Vulcans are prone to a number of behaviors the other humanities find difficult to fathom, but masochism is not one of them. The doors to the bridge hissed open then. Jim had just enough... Jim had just time enough to glance around the bridge and see how uneasy everyone looked before McCoy came in with a tall, handsome, blond-bearded man pushing a floater in front of him. "'I'll want a report in a couple hours when McCoy's done,' Jim said. "'You, Scotty and Catullic, whoever else can cast light on this mess, down in sickbay.' "'Shut up, Jim. Don, tilt that thing up, will you? About eighty degrees. Good. Step on it here, Jim.' All right, Don, level him out. Come on, Captain Hero. Take the con, Spock, Jim said, and keep her safe. The doors closed on him. The data are in, Catullic chimed, and the only good thing about them is that you can't possibly be as disturbed by them as I am. Try me, Jim said, sitting up on the diagnostic bed and stretching. Bones had pumped him as full of pharmaceuticals as a drugstore. He felt much better, and wondered how long it was going to last. Gathered about the bed were Scotty and Spock and Catullic. McCoy leaned on the wall at its head. Let me go first, Kit, McCoy said. Jim, I've had the opportunity to go over quite a number of the crew while you've been down here. There were a lot of minor injuries during this past inversion. Injuries like yours, sustained in the experience itself, when it was impossible for anyone to move or even breathe, much less be in the places they report to having been. None of the injuries were very serious. I still have a few people to check. You were something of a priority for me. Bones, I still don't understand. How could these things have actually happened to us? They weren't real. Bones folded his arms and leaned back, shaking his head. Jim, you're heading for trouble. A lot of problems. Wars, for example, get started when we point at one reality and claim that it's realer than another. A lot of years in xenopsychology have convinced me that anything you experience is a reality. And that's not a difficulty, since realities naturally include one another. For example, my reality includes an Enterprise, and a Jim Kirk, and a Spock, God knows why. Spock put up an eyebrow. And yours include not only all those things, but a McCoy, too. There's also another kind of inclusion. For example, you might dream that a monster's after you and know it's real, then wake up and know you'd been dreaming, and also know that you're uh, in a more inclusive or senior reality now. There are waking realities apparently senior to ours. Leah's na Madai would be an example by their standards. McCoy sighed. What I'm suggesting is that all our personal realities are becoming far more inclusive, more senior than usual. Our inversion experiences seem to have started out with an inward emphasis and have since been turning slowly outward to include not only other people, but other people's perceptions. Could this have something to do with the increasing... We're not Chekhov or Scotty. Could this have something to do with the increasing length of the inversions, Scotty said. Bones shrugged. Might be. The barriers live in minds. The barriers living minds erect between their own realities and others could very well be a function of entropy, and we've been spending more and more time away from it. Something else interests me more, however, and I wonder if the space we're in has something to do with it. There was a common factor among all the experiences the crew had this last time out. Every one of them perceived some kind of danger to the Enterprise and acted to stop it. This is going to sound a little peculiar, and I have no proof for it, whatever, but I'm not sure it was Mr. Sulu alone who saved the ship. I think the entire crew sensed something the matter, and it was the intention and concentration of the whole group that did the trick. Jim nodded. All right. Spock? Spock had been gazing at the table. He raised his eyes now, looking very grave. Sir... Science Department's assessment of the situation in the space around us is extremely distressing. We have succeeded in determining that the time-space turbulence in this area does indeed have a locus of origin. That locus is far from here, even in terms of use of the inversion drive. 
nearly 2,200,000 light years beyond the borders of the Lesser Magellanic, almost out of the local group of galaxies itself. Our sensors have not been able to detect it primarily by indirect methods. Try that again. Our sensors have been able to detect it primarily by indirect methods. Not that they are able to actually sense anything in that spot. But when pointed in that direction, that is where all their functions fail most catastrophically. That fact in itself joins with the presence of staggering amounts of Hawking radiation to suggest the nature of the locus. What we are seeing, or more accurately not seeing, is a place where another universe has breached ours. Scotty looked at Spock, surprised, but not very worried. We've seen that before, man. What's the problem? This this other universe, Catullic said, appears not to have entropy at all. It is leaking non-entropy, anentropia, into ours, and the breach through which it does so is widening. How fast? Jim said. At a huge hyperlight velocity, Spock said. The effect is able to propagate with no regard to the speed of light. With no regard to the speed limit of light in this universe, since it is actually a function of the other universe's expansion. Within a month at most, it will have affected all of the Lesser Magellanic Cloud. Within two months, three maximum, it will encompass our own galaxy, and within a year or perhaps two, it could not have encompassed it could not only have encompassed the entire local group, but the whole megagalactic group of which the locals are an insignificant part. Scotty went white. McCoy stood absolutely still beside him. Even Catullock wasn't chiming. What will happen? Jim said. To the inhabited planets, you mean. Spock looked at Jim, and no Vulcan calm could hide his distress. Without entropy, there can be no life as we know it. Existence as such will simply cease without time to pass through. As that other universe intrudes into, or rather around ours, and finally contains it, anentropia will everywhere abolish life. And it will not happen quickly or easily. Entropic space will first mix slowly with anentropic, like two fluids, as it is doing in the space around us. Spock stepped over to the sick bay wall screen. On, he said. Outside visual. The screen came on, revealing a vista of blackness and stars that, for the first fraction of a second, looked like any other scene at the edge of a large globular cluster. A scattering of stars, thicker toward one side, thinning toward the cluster's fringes. But immediately the illusion of normality and tranquility was destroyed. The stars would not be still, and this was no healthy fluctuation like that in the skies of faraway Lorien. These stars glittered feverishly, as if seen from the bottom of a dirty, turbulent atmosphere. Some of them exploded, and did so not cleanly, but hesitantly, by fits and starts, then contracted sluggishly to dim, diseased-looking globes. The stars flickered and guttered, like failing candles in a bitter wind, as entropy and the lack of it washed over them in waves light years long, and time ran forwards, backwards, every which way. This was no pure, fierce burning into slow collapse and oblivion. This was protracted suffering, lingering death. Not even the darkness of empty space seemed clean. It crawled. Jim looked away. Some of those stars have planets, Captain, Spock said. Some of those planets have life, if you can call it that. It is a life in which nothing can be depended on where the laws of nature may be abruptly suspended at the whim of whatever eddy of time or not time a world is caught in. I dare say the inhabitants would welcome death if they could completely achieve it, for many of them will have been in the process of dying for what subjectively would feel like ages. Such a fate awaits all the known worlds, the Klingons, the Federation, all the hundreds of kinds of humanity we know, all the myriads we do not, in our galaxy, and in every other. Jim looked at the screen again in fascinated horror, looked away again as the horror outweighed every other feeling. There must be something we can do for them, he said in a whisper. Deal with the problem at its source, Catullic said. Indeed, we must do so, Captain. We caused it. Her chiming was pained, 
somber sounding, a dirge for dying worlds. Jim looked at her, then up at Spock. Spock nodded. Probability approaches 100% very closely, Captain, he said. The presence of the symbiotic spectral lines in the stars here, the same lines as in 109 Piscium and Zeta 10 Scorpii, confirms it. A breach of physical integrity on a massive scale, just considered locally. And out there, past the local group, a place where the physicality of our own universe's very fabric has been compromised. The topological process going on out there is fascinating. But that is all there is to be said for it. It is a multidimensional analog to the old topological puzzle in which one torus linked through another may completely swallow its companion. Our universe will wind up contained within that other, and time, becoming impossible, will cease. All existence will go with it. I theorize, and Catullic agrees with me, that every time we have used the inversion apparatus, the strain on the universe itself has become worse. Finally, on the jump before last, it tore. The jump we just made, as far as our measurements can tell us, aggravated the situation considerably. Should we go to the locus of this anomalous effect, the extreme length of the jump will aggravate it even more, accelerating the process. Yet so, to a lesser degree, would any attempt to return home and warn the humanities. Recommendations, Jim said. Attempt penetration of the anomaly, Spock said. Allowing that we do, what can we do there? There's a strong possibility... Oh, sorry, wrong voice again. <clears throat> There's a strong possibility that this breach can be healed, Catullic said. Captain... You and Montgomery have been pleased to joke about what my physics is good for besides confusing you. But we are alive and talking now partly because of it. We're in the problem we're in because of it, too, McCoy muttered. Catullic jangled at him, an annoyed sound. Please, Leonard, I don't disclaim my direct responsibility for the imminent destruction of life as we know it, and as we don't, everywhere. But with that in mind, I don't have the time for thorax thumping. Breast beaten... Scotty said gently. Right. Thank you. I don't have time for that, and you don't have time to stand around and watch me indulge in it. I need to do something about this mess. Starfleet can court-martial me later, if I live. Captain, I can maintain and manipulate entropy on a local level. I can tailor the entropy shell, and that has, so far, been protecting the ship so that it also protects each individual crew person. Nothing that generates a life field will be in danger of facing anentropia unshielded in the ship or out of it. Also, I am very sure I can work out a way to use the inversion drive itself to add enough power to my equations so that I can blanket that whole rift with entropy and weave space together again. Once that's done, we can return to this area using short hops rather than the long ones that strain space so, and I can undo all the damage possible here. And if you can't? Then, since we will be so close to the effect, we will, as the story goes, we will, as the story says, go out. Bang! Just like a candle. Spock looked down at Catullic. However, I ran another estimate of the probability of your success. It is much higher than we thought at first. Was that Spock speaking? I don't know. Oh? Oh? How much? 48%. It's gone up to 50-50. Is that it, Spock? And this is an improvement, McCoy said, exasperated. So we're going to do that whole thing again with a different voice? Nope, just move on. Bones, Jim said as calmly as he could. Do you have a recommendation? Yes. One that worked real well for me when I was younger. I'm going to get in bed and pull the covers up over my ears so that this will all pass away. I recommend you all do the same. He looked at Spock. You're going to need more covers. Bones. All right, all right, Jim. With each jump, the crew's individual mental integrity has broken down further so that they're perceiving external realities as, well, no, that's not accurate. All experience is internal when you get down to it. Doctor. This is no time for a lecture in ego-positivism. When the theory fits, Spock, wear it, or freeze in the wind. Jim, I submit that a longer jump is going to break down those walls between people even more completely. There's no guarantee that we'll still be able to function as individuals. We may wind up as some kind of weird group mind. 
Also, any nightmare or dangerous vision that one of us may come up with might be able to affect some or all of the others with fatal effects. You better instruct the ship to run itself as completely as possible when we pop out and to refuse override orders from anyone but department heads. Not that they'll be any more resistant than anyone else. It just seems it would cut down on the possibility of accidents. And for heaven's sake, warn the crew about what might happen. I haven't yet chosen a course of action, Jim said. However, all that is noted. Anybody else? No one said anything. Very well. Mr. Spock, I'm going to step out for a few minutes. You have the con while I'm gone. Bones, will it be all right? Just a quick outside the ship? I won't go far. Don't overdo it, and stay on the opposite side of the ship from that. McCoy gestured at the deactivated screen. No argument. Jim swung down off the table and headed out. He made his way down to maintenance, surprising the Sulamid lieutenant there, who was cleaning off consoles with antistat spray and five or six claws as in, in as many tentacles. Break me out a suit, Mr. Attende, Jim said. Not a work rig, just a routine maintenance pack with a full angle helm. Sir, affirmative, pleased, the Sulamid said, pulling down the wipes and spray. It whirled over to the measurement console while Jim stepped up on the sensor plate to let the computer read his mass and size and metabolic rate. Okay, yes, it did say mass and size. Mr. Attende's tentacles slipped expertly along the surface of the console for a second. Bay 12, sir, he said. Helm fetch one moment. Jim went to the suit bay that hissed open for him and backed into the suit held by the grapples. They did up the lower seals for him, and by the time he detached himself and was sealing the top of the suit, Attende came waltzing along and... Attende came waltzing along the suiting floor in a whirl of tentacles, some of which were holding an observer's helm clear all around. The Sulamid put the helmet on Jim, touching its seals, and... Wow, I think I'm going to have to quit here sooner than I thought. I wanted to, I mean. The Sulamid... The Sulamid put the helmet on Jim, touching its seals into place, and then checking the readouts in front... One more time. The Sulamid put the helmet on Jim, touching its seals into place, and then checking the readouts on the front of the suit. Heat pressure, astrotronics, positive uprunning, Attende said. Sir, exit preference. Captain's gig in shuttle bay. Too long evacuate, Jim said, falling into hollow phrases for, mostly for the fun of it. Maintenance lock. Scuttle shoot, aye, Attende said, flushing mauve with the old pun, and whirling away to the console again to start the little scuttling lock cycling. It chimed green and ready within a few seconds. Gratitude, Mr. Attende. Jim said, stepping stiffly into the lock. Service pleasant, Captain, the Sulamid said over Kirk's helm intercom as the door slid shut between them. Nice communication. Hmm? Jim thought, not quite getting the syntax on that last statement, as little by little air and sound hissed out of the lock around him. Oh well. He was left little time to wonder. The door into space opened as he turned to it. Jim took hold of one side of the lock and jumped out, pushing himself free of the lock's light gravity and out into the cold dark. No sounds now but his own breathing and the gentle creaking of the suit as it made the best compromise it could between the near-absolute zero of outside and the twenty-four degrees Celsius within. We can fly out of the galaxy, he thought to himself, but we can't build a suit that won't creak like old bones and make you look like a gorilla. What's fleet coming to these days, anyway? He laughed at himself and at the silly cavil, as he punched the controls for the propulsion pack. Thrust pushed him strongly in the lower back, away from the great dim wall. He hung beside. On purpose, he restrained himself from looking around on the way out, wanting to save the view for just the right moment. This proved difficult, for something was missing. The stars, the million familiar eyes that had always stared at him before, were gone leaving a darkness that unnerved him and drew his eyes. But he refused to be drawn. Jim turned up the heat, 
He was getting chill in the suit, and applied reverse thrust about a hundred meters from Enterprise, bringing himself around to look at her. Silhouetting her from far behind, the lesser... Ma- Silhouetting her from far behind, the lesser Magellanic was a bright spill of blue gems falling together through the empty night. The ship herself lay becalmed with only minimal running lights up, so that, except for a red gleam here and there, she was mostly a great shadowy shape floating in the void, with only a thin skin of faint starlight defining her hull on this side. She looked mysterious, numinous, huger than ever. She made Jim think of that time he'd been night-driving off the coast of Northern California, had been surprised in moonlit water by the whale. The humpback had hung beside him, singing, saying something in that incredibly complex language the scientists said bore the same resemblance to human speech that a Beethoven symphony does to a kazoo solo. Then, uncomprehending and uncomprehended, the whale had cruised off about its lawful occasions, leaving Jim to feel he had been examined, accepted, and left to his own devices. He felt that way now. The enterprise of his vision alive and familiar and solicitous of her children, was gone, replaced by a remote, unconcerned entity, more an absence than a presence. She floated untroubled in the freezing dark, in her element. She belonged here. He was the stranger. Deliberately, then, as if turning away from even her slight safety, Jim brought himself about to look at what's... to look at... (sighs) Deliberately, then, as if turning away from even her slight safety, Jim brought himself about to look at what cast the starlight on her son. One more time. Deliberately, then, as if turning away from even her slight safety, Jim brought himself about to look at what cast the starlight on her hull, and the view was very different from the vista available on the observation deck, where one was snug inside a ship. There it hung above him, a galaxy. The galaxy. Not shot safely outside a clear steel window. Not even nearby any longer. But more distant than the Magellanic. A bright shored island, hanging grand and silent in the airless wastes, displaying all of its starry majesty at once. Jim just drifted there, letting himself see. Sol was lost in the sweep of stars in the leftward arm, an utterly insignificant twenty-fourth magnitude spark that not even the great ten-meter Artemis lunar reflector could have made out at this range. The whole Federation, from the Orion worlds, from the Orionis worlds to the Vela Congeries, was a patch of sparkle that an upraised finger could cover. The Klingon and Romulan empires were lost entirely. Awe grew in him again, and a muted joy, but also an increasingly powerful disquiet so strong that inside the suit Jim simply took so strong that inside the suit Jim simply shook for a moment. The world that all his life had been around him was suddenly outside him, and he was outside it. Way out in the coldest deeps where no star shone, Jim gazed in uneasy wonder at the little spiral shaped home of life, with all its lights left burning in the dark. It finally sank in, as it hadn't even after the first jump, what he'd done to himself and the people he commanded. He'd gone too far this time. He and 438 souls were truly where no man had gone before, alone as no one in history had ever been. It delighted him. It terrified him. His voice sounded loud in the helm as, meaning it, he whispered that old phrase he'd read first in English, O Lord, thy sea is so great, and my vessel is so small. And the shaking and the awe went away. For that brought him to the matter he had come out here to resolve. It wasn't his crew's feelings about the danger of the situation that concerned Jim. The great starship's crews were selected with the danger of their missions in mind. No one made it onto a starship who didn't have one very important trait— an insatiable hunger and love for strange new worlds and impossible occurrences, a hunger so powerful that even the fear of death could be set aside for its sake when necessary. 
Enterprise and her sister starships were crewed by raving xenophiles. That was. What was on Jim's mind was potential loss of life, or, in this case, the permanent discontinuation of it. As usual, he had to get past that issue so he could choose what to do. It wasn't easy. All the other times that he'd almost lost the Enterprise came back to haunt him now, neatly summed up in the thought of his whole ship going out. Bang! Just like a candle. Once again, Jim faced his responsibility for 438 beings, some of whom he'd come to love dearly. This time, though, there was also the small matter of the whole galaxy he was looking at, and all other galaxies everywhere, going out, in the same way he feared the Enterprise would, ceasing to be, forever. Jim's first thought, after the loathing that instantly followed the idea of risking the lives of his officers and friends for anything, was that their lives were a small price to pay for the continued well-being of every other life in the universe. But, whether they would agree with him or not, that was a knee-jerk reaction, a position as potentially immoral as its opposite, that all the universe's lives could or should be sacrificed for the sake of 400. It didn't necessarily follow that the needs of the many outweighed the needs of the few or the one. That was a choice that could be ethically made only if the one was your own self. What proof was there, after all, that 400 souls outweighed 4 trillion, or the other way around? Trying to equate numbers with value was a blind alley. Nothing but one more way to avoid making a responsible choice. Once, when he was younger, he had seriously considered sacrificing a whole universe to be for the love of another human being. He wasn't that person anymore. Another question occupied Jim today. When he and his crew signed aboard the Enterprise, they had all sworn to serve her purpose, the defense and preservation of life and the expansion of life's quality by exploration and discovery. The question was simply, how could they serve that purpose best? By hurrying home with word of the breach in the universe and letting Starfleet find an answer, one that might be better than any enterprise could come up with unassisted? Or by attempting to deal with the situation on their own and sending back word of how they did? Are you kidding? Don't you ever learn? They'll treat the results of the drive the same way they did the drive itself. They'll give it to a committee. The universe will have to be eaten by an entropia before they even manage to pick who the committee chairman will be. Besides, Catullic is the expert on the... Besides, Catullic is the expert on this stuff. And we've got her right here. And the Federation would just send out for some Vulcans anyway. If you want Vulcans, you've got one. And he seems to know what's going on. More reasons and rationalizations of that sort kept coming up. After a minute or two, Jim put a stop to them and pushed them all aside, totaling up the arguments on either side of the situation to see what outnumbered what was no way to choose either. If you tried to treat the universe as a sum, no matter how carefully you added it up, the answer was always an irrational number. Nor was the cool guidance of logic a reliable refuge. Logical alternatives had been the death of many a starship captain and crew before. Jim held still and spent a moment just looking at the whole problem, in the form of the bright burning home that hung before him, symbol of all the uncountable lives that lay in his hands, symbol of his responsibility to them. Then he put all the reasons aside, all the hopes, all the fears, and chose. He glanced at his chrono. It had taken him seven minutes, Jim touched the communicator toggle on one sleeve. Kirk to Enterprise. Bridge, said Uhura. I thought you were off shift. You went for a walk, she said, as if that should have been explanation enough. I did that. Have Sulu and Chekhov work out that course for the anomaly with Spock, Jim said. And tell McCoy to speak to the department head so each of you can warn your crew. This next step is going to be a doozy. Coming in now, sir? Just a few more minutes, mother. Kirk out. He switched off to the sound of her decorously stifled laughter. He drifted in the dark and the silence a while longer, gazing at the mighty spiral, now so small, 
and then at the Enterprise, seemingly huger, but just as still. He began to get a glimpse of what that Andorian crew woman had meant so long ago, that apparent size was indeed a symbol, as irrelevant to the essentials it contained as someone's height. McCoy's say was to the quality of his soul. It was the inner nature that counted, the meaning, not the matter. And even then, as Catullic had said, what mattered was who was doing the meaning. Everything was the same size, really, until consciousness endowed that size with affect. If the sea seemed huge, and his vessel small, and the radiant galaxy infinitely beautiful, it was because he saw them and loved them that way. Jim snorted at himself with mockery. Jim snorted at himself in mockery. Getting sentimental in your old age, he thought, and turned himself with care, aiming himself back at the Enterprise. But he stole a last long look over his shoulder before he cut in his jets. Is the crew ready? Good. Then take us out, Mr. Sulu. Yes, sir. Engineering, implement inversion. And God have mercy on our souls, McCoy muttered from behind the command chair. Well, there we go. That would be chapters 9 and 10. And it's midnight, just barely. I'm going to call it an evening. That was a long live stream, 56 minutes in total, making it the longest. Opening, ramble, and everything. Have yourselves a